First thing you want to do is you want to look at your function and you want to analyze what they call the sign changes. Okay, so what are exactly are the sign changes? Well, it's where it changes from positive to negative or negative to positive. So here you can see we've got positive 3x to the fifth, negative 2x to the fourth, and so on. So I've written down the signs, but let's check to see how many times it switches. So positive negative, that's once. Negative to positive, that's twice. Positive negative, that's a third time. Negative to negative, it doesn't change. So that means we have a three sign changes. So what that tells us is we go over to our positive negative imaginary uh, chart over here. Sometimes this is called like a P and I chart. And what that tells us is we have a maximum of three positive zeros. Now what does that mean, three positive zeros? It means that when you go to the right of the y-axis over here, it's going to cross that x-axis a maximum of three times, right? Now, if we want to analyze the maximum times that it crosses the x-axis over here in the negative range, okay, to the left of the y-axis, what we do is replace x with negative x. So let me go ahead and do that for us here. We've got three times negative x to the fifth minus two times negative x to the fourth plus negative x cubed uh, minus four times negative x minus eight. If we go back and simplify, we get negative three x to the fifth, negative two x to the fourth, negative x cubed, uh, positive four x, and negative eight. So we've got a negative, 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 positive, negative. So here you can see it's changing once, twice. So what that tells us is that we have a maximum of two negatives. And then if we add across here, three plus two plus zero equals five, it should always add up to this highest degree of the polynomial, okay, five in this case. Now, the other thing that's interesting is that if the coefficients of your polynomial are all real, meaning there's none that are imaginary, then what happens is if your zeros come, uh, if you have any imaginary zeros, they come as conjugate pairs. So what that means is, for example, if we had two imaginary zeros, then what happens is we have to decrease the number of positive zeros by two or the number of negative zeros by two. So we always go down by two, four, six, eight by an even number, right? An even amount because of these imaginary ones coming in uh, conjugate pairs. So in this case, another possibility is we could have one positive, two negative, and two imaginary. Another possibility would be we could have three positive, zero negative, and two imaginary. Another possibility we could have one positive, zero negative, and four imaginary. Now, I can't take another two away from this one and make this a negative one. You can't have a negative number of zeros. So these are our only combinations here. Now, you're probably asking yourself, well, Mario, why does this even matter, right? Well, here's the thing. If you're trying to use your rational zero theorem to you know, calculate the zeros, the P over Q method you probably learned in your class, what you can do is you can be strategic. You can say, well, I know that there's at least one positive zero. If it's this scenario here or here, there might be uh, no negative zeros. So what you can do is you can say, well, I might not want to check over here for a negative zero first because it might be these scenarios where there's not any negative zeros. So I know there's at least one positive zero. Let me see if I can find that one first. And so that just gives you a starting point. It sometimes helps you to narrow down you know, the possibilities when you're going to check for those uh, rational zeros.